which is increasingly not in the business of spying as much as it is in carrying out secret black operations. The CIA is more and more militarized. And as people who are looking specifically at this huge burgeoning part of NATO's war armament, and I'm saying that consciously, it's the US and 46 to 49 other countries that are now using unarmed drones. Most of them either already have or are thinking about weaponized drones, unarmed aerial vehicles, I mean unmanned aerial vehicles, many of which are armed. So people say, well, what is so special about drones? And this is a question I'd like us to throw out and kick around a bit. I'm going to give you some questions and then hopefully we'll get questions going on to each other. One of the things that I've found among the anti-war movement going around the country is that there's a theory that the drone wars are happening because they're driven essentially by the weapons manufacturers. Northrop Grumman, Boeing, you know, you can think of a handful of well-known ones. There are thousands and thousands of companies getting into the drone business. Everything from the engineering, to the software, to the parts, to the transport. And now we have a situation where we believe the CIA has contracted with some of these private companies to fly and operate the drones. So you're having killing, as you've had in Iraq, by Blackwater through the, through the, the intermediary of some kind of involvement with somebody connected to the United States government. And they're pushing the button on the drone. They're guiding it and choosing targets, it seems. This is a question. Um, and it's tempting to say, well, all this is happening because so the weapons manufacturers can make so damn much money out of it. And it is obscene, the amount of money that's going in. Look at the cuts even in the Defense Department budget in the last year. Everything got cut, but what, not everything. Some things got cut. What got really robustly increased? UAV, unmanned aerial vehicles, most of which are weaponized. We all know, I think, or maybe we've heard a little bit, but let me just bookmark the fact that domestic drones are burgeoning as well. We, I think, are all fairly alarmed over the National Defense Authorization Act and the surveillance powers and the, and the uh, detention powers that it gives the president. There's also a new ruling by the Federal Aviation Agency that directs them um, by 2013 to have the civilian airways ready for domestic drones, and this is being phased in. Domestic drones with weapons on them? Well, the New York Police Department, which Bloomberg reminds us is the seventh largest army in the world, at his disposal is getting drones. Other major US cities are getting drones. They say they're for surveillance. How do we know what they are? This is all growing, so let's bookmark the domestic piece of that and say that's very important, potentially very repressive. The biggest part of this is the drones that are being used against the six countries that are the focus of the, the US so-called global war on terror. That's Bush's name. Obama's administration calls it the overseas contingency operation in order to make it as bland as possible. But it's really the same SHIT, exactly the same thing. And so you have, we know about drones being used in Afghanistan, 
That's very well documented. They've also been used in Iraq within the last year. Strikes. Yemen is in the news over the last week because here's the CIA essentially saying, we want to bypass any approval of the executive. We want to have carte blanche from the beginning, right now, that if we designate a target, nobody's going to interfere with that. We're deciding who the targets are. And this, this is because Al-Qaeda Al is a threat in Yemen, according to this, you know, the same cabal, in my opinion, who are making up the targets are also justifying the targets. And then we know they've been used in Somalia and Libya and the big one, Pakistan. There's a fair amount of documentation that perhaps a third to a half of the deaths in Pakistan can be considered civilian. And then even if you look at how the killers are naming the insurgents or militants, you know, it's always insurgents or militants that are killed. But as the friends in Pakistan point out, just because someone in North Waziristan is walking around with an AK-47, it does not mean they fit in either of those categories. All men carry those weapons. It's a crazy situation, but it does not mean that all those guys carrying weapons are dedicated to bringing down the United States. It means that's the culture. So people are being killed in these drone strikes who are, for all intents and purposes, normal citizens of North Waziristan. This is what our government is doing in our name. And this has um, been an ongoing message World Can't Wait has been trying to bring in for years. We are responsible for what our government does in our name. American lives are not more important than other lives. Not, just not. Humanity and the planet come first. We might feel this is an uphill battle, and many days I do when I'm out talking to people about the US wars. I feel that most strategically what it is we can do with these drone models and the orange jumpsuits and the bringing of the global war on terror in front of the people that live in this country is to begin the ch to change the political terrain so that people look at those things and begin to think illegitimate, unjust, immoral. My government is doing things that are illegitimate, unjust, immoral and doesn't have the right to do these things to other people in my name. I think that is an incredibly powerful concept and potentially has the, the possibility of setting up a situation that we got to in the late 60s in this country where the images of the young girl running down the road who had been napalmed, the images of Mi Lai, all those images of war which carried such a heavy and had such a heavy effect on ending that war not because it cost too much but because it, the moral cost of it was too much not because the financial cost was too much so these are some of the messages world can't wait has been working on and i really want to open up the conversation about that let me just put one more thing out to you World Can't Wait has been working really for months on getting a team together to be in Chicago from the um, 12th of May until the 21st of May, which is 10 days or so ahead of when NATO is there and there's a big permitted march on Sunday the 20th. Our plan is to do what we always do, is to go out to the people. We are going into high schools with Iraq and Afghanistan vets to talk about why they shouldn't Hello. sign up. 
we're going out yes, with yes. groups of people in orange jumpsuits uniting with right. Witness Against Torture and, uh, and other people in Chicago and we want to bring some of the drones. We want to go to shopping centers, we want to go in front of college or high school campuses, we want to go out to the people of Chicago who have already been heavily propagandized. That NATO is a wonderful sign of international cooperation and it's so great they're coming to our city. It's giving Chicago and, and Mayor Rahm Emanuel and President Obama so much prestige for what they're doing. This is what people are hearing. And unfortunately, it's having an effect on Occupy Chicago and the other Occupies around the country, I'm afraid. A lot of the interest in protesting NATO G8 was in protesting the G8 for very valid reasons. This, this world is very unequal economically, and the G8 is a symbol of that. Hello, this is Carol. But there is not so much understanding of why we should be against NATO, why we should be protesting it, and what good protest does. And I'm getting some blank stares, including from people in the anti-war <coughs> movement, about, well, even if we go, what, could, what good can we do? So I'd like to put the question to you, because I'm going. I know other people in this room are going, and I'd like us to come out of today with a clearer plan of what kind of difference we can make by going to interact with people. Um, so maybe I'll go down to the chair level and we can just have more of a round table discussion. Is that good? If, if people do want to know more about the drone war, Medea Benjamin's here tonight with her book and um, she's done an incredible amount of research and she's really the person to ask all the detailed questions to. I'm just the person who's out there trying to wrangle with people who live in this country. In case you can't hear me, I might use this, but I don't think it's really needed. When you were talking, I got this insight. I remember uh, in Viet you know, the Vietnam period, uh, you were saying the images we got were of uh, Vietnamese being abused, and that really changed people's uh, feelings about the war. Do you notice they're allowing people to see pictures of soldiers being abusive? They're promoting that in the news. They're not talking about the victims. They're not talking about the bombings. I mean, there's a lot of things they could allow in the news. But they, I'm wondering if they're trying to create uh, an image that people don't like the soldiers, you know? And they're trying to make sure that, that that's what uh, people are feeling, you know? They're trying to put a wedge between the uh, American army and uh, the people of this country uh, in order to uh, change the, the, uh, the talk and make sure that nobody focuses on the disruption that's going on. <coughs> Let's take a couple of comments and if people want to go, other questions or that thread, I think that's very important. Layla? I mean, uh, look, look at the scandal this week in Afghanistan. Yeah, right. I mean, Obama came out and condemned the release of these photos and criticized the LA Times for publishing them. This was a leak by someone in the military who held on to this for a while. These are the pictures of the corpse abuse, the corpse mutilation, the people posing, smiling, joking around with body parts. Just utterly depraved. And and, you know, then you have the Defense Department saying, but this is an aberration. This is not the kind of thing we do. We wouldn't tolerate this. Well, you did tolerate it. You did tolerate it for over a year. And it only came out because somebody in the military was so sickened by it that they couldn't live with it anymore. And then you condemn them and the LA Times for showing it. But, but you are right because all we're seeing of the victims is body parts. 
months. We are not seeing the Afghan peace volunteers on CNN. We're not seeing anything that humanizes the victims. And especially, here's the huge contradiction I feel with the drone war. It isn't napalming children like in Vietnam. There's no unembedded press there to send back these photos. Drones obliterate the victim. There's, you know, this is difficult to say, but bodies literally are blown to bits. And there is no, either is no physical evidence, or in the case of North Waziristan, photographers and document, people that want to document are blocked from going. And as we know, last fall, two 16-year-old kids that were given cameras to go back and document in northeast Pakistan were themselves killed by a mm. So let's go here and here. Lee, I'd like to bring up the Bradley Manning case. I became aware two years ago. Uh, how, how many haven't heard of Bradley Manning? I don't want to repeat too much. Well, he reported crimes uh, on the internet. It shows a helicopter gunship shooting people in an intersection and so on and so forth. Uh, a year ago, Ed and I were at Quantico. They put him in solitary confinement for over a year. 250 lawyers wrote a letter of protest to the president, and his pretrial hearing began where I was stationed 49 years ago at Fort Meade, and I will be there this week. In fact, Tuesday at the Justice, this coming Tuesday at the Justice Department, there's going to be a demonstration because the third phase or whatever it is of his court martial, you know, leading to it, that's going to be this week at Fort Meade. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, unless they change something at the last minute. So that's how they treat a soldier who reports a war crime. Uh, there may be more to it, I'm not sure, but I want to find out, and everybody should know about this. Right, and it's very important to understand that he's getting that treatment and the, those who actually have committed the war crimes have either not been investigated or very likely punished in comparison. No, first death. The, um, I've heard reports that they're uh, either already using or talking about using depleted uranium on some of the missiles and bombs that drones are going to be carrying around. And I don't know, I mean, there's no requirement of reporting uh, whether uh, that's being done now. So that's a problem. And then I'm sure most of you have already heard this as well, that this Reaper drone, uh, they're talking about fueling it with nuclear power fuel cells. And imagine what would happen if one of those things falls and, and crashes. What's going to happen to the environment that, of course, humans are part of? We, we tend to think about the environment as separate from the body, like the head, and then there's the rest of the body. You know, and it was established by some great scientists, you know, 10 years ago, maybe the year of the brain, during the year the brain, that the head is it connected to the body. So it's like, well, we are connected to the environment. So humans are affected, public health is affected, and the potential for that should be talked about, I think, should be something that our movement uh, does not tolerate, the use of, you know, DU or any, any uh, toxic substances on these well, they're all, I mean, all toxic substances on yeah, but, missiles and bombs, but that we wouldn't use nuclear fuel cells to power Reaper drones. Yeah. Is it just, um, I want to, um, a clarification in drones work. I hear when they want to use the target, they get, uh, they get a devices to people to put it in the, is that right? Or Yeah, Jane. In 2009, and she described this process whereby U.S. intelligence or U.S. military was was giving out homing devices that um, their agents or, or whoever they were, locals, were given to hang on the doorknobs to identify where Taliban or, or Al Qaeda was. And of course, I mean, look. This is how the guys ended up in Guantanamo. Yeah. 
people turned them in for $5,000 yeah. bounties. This is that level of, you don't know the frigging country you're going to. Yeah. You treat everyone as the enemy. You know, it's all the other. And you create a situation where people are turning each other in and fighting against each other. And this is all supposed to make them and us safer. <laughs> So if they don't have these devices, they can They don't know where the target is. No, that that was a, a particular program to turn local Afghans into snitches. But they can still see where. But they, they can still attack, right? They have look. Here's here's the other thing. I was <coughs> talking to a prosecutor on the train up here today who knew nothing about any of this. So he's like, okay, how does the drone work, and why is it so bad? Part of the, the thing that we're dealing with in terms of the psychic numbing with drones is now the U.S. military is training more pilots for unmanned drones than they are fighter bomber pilots. Mm -hmm. And this, this, so this prosecutor is okay, okay, but would you say that this is worse than somebody getting bombed? Well, here's the difference. A fighter bomber is dropping the bomb and going off into where? He doesn't see what happened. These drone pilots are 18 inches away. They're seeing the whole thing for days. Then they're actually seeing the drone hit. They're living with that. And to me, this is an inhumanity piled on an inhumanity, and it is turning people into completely shut down from the actual relationship of war, which a hundred years ago was one guy shooting another guy or knifing him or bayoneting him. It was nasty, but he didn't have the potential to kill all these civilians at once. A, a point on that, um, in 2009 when we were in Creech, Mm -hmm. um, which we had found out about from Kathy Kelly yeah. um, when she was um, Father Rui Vitale had befriended the, the chaplain or the commander of the base out there mm -hmm. and he admitted to Father Rui that we cannot get enough chaplains and counselors for these guys because the big disconnect is they do this nine to five then they go home to their, they don't, they don't live on a base, they don't have the camaraderie of their fellow soldiers. They go home to their families or they go home to their own apartment in town. And so there's this big cognizant disconnect. And you know, and I mean, I can't even, I can't even imagine the terror of looking at something like that on a screen and then going home and talking to my kids. Yeah. And, ta and then talking to my own kids, hey, how was school today? I mean... Mm -hmm. I, I had an experience last Saturday or Friday in front of Trader Joe's in Brooklyn Heights where we had three of the big drones, the Reapers. And it was such an incredibly interesting mixed crowd, but these five kids that were 12 and 13 boys, um, they, they told me they were all Palestinian, right? Well. Probably their grandfathers are Palestinian, and they grew up in Syria or Lebanon. I, I don't know where they grew up, but they said, this is really cool, you know, because we have the video, and they were watching this really cool, and they love to play video games. And, and I started talking about, well, you know, here's the problem. It's actually not a game. And here's some of the pictures of people who have been killed, and I mentioned Yemen. And this one kid says to me, Yemen, okay, that's where I'm from. Why are they killing people in Yemen? He's like, Yemen is so poor, we have to get out of there. And it, it, it just, the reason I'm bringing that up is the, the point of messaging. How do we make this not be a video game for people? And how do we bring the reality of the war when we don't have the picture? I think this is a big problem for us, to figure out how do we imagine this for people and how do we put this responsibility in front of people, even on the street that we're just meeting, um, right here and then 
Part of the problem is that we, what we find most abhorrent is most celebrated in movies, etc. The CIA has a long history, as we all know, of assassinations, rogue assassinations, black ops, that people pretend never have happened. Now, I see the drones as making that visible. And in fact, the US military operation is now that. And so even the use of the word war is inappropriate. What's happened is the rogue black op CIA assassinations over the years in the various countries yeah. are no longer secret. Mm -hmm. they're, they're visible. And so in a way, that's helpful that they're visible, but they're seen as smart. In other words, it's a guerrilla operation on the world. And isn't that savvy? So that's what we're up against, is that what we find to be rogue, sinister, that that emblemizes, um, is viewed as <coughs> smart. It's against the red coats, the, the, revolution, the colonies use guerrilla warfare against these red coats, which is marked. Well, that's what we're doing in people's eyes. We're smart enough to not have to march in rows and columns. <coughs> How do we combat that? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> and that it's keeping us safer. Yeah. Back. Um, I am trying to figure out uh, how to formulate this, but um, last year when we uh, did the action up here, uh, a few of us from Ithaca met with uh, um, the, guy, the on the ground guy for our congressman. And um, it was an interesting conversation and somewhat chilling conversation. Um, he sits, our congressman, Maurice Hinchy, who is retiring now, but he, um, you know, sits on the, on the caucus, the mm -hmm. UVA, is that right? Okay. UAB. Uh, UAB. UAB. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, they, he sits on their, the, the caucus, and, mm -hmm. um, but uh, Dan Lamb said to us, um, he said, well, look, the genies are really out of the bat bottle. What do you want us to do? And, um, and I said, well, you could at least make a statement. You could do something. <laughs> you could say something. Right now, nothing's even said. Because he's like, well, you know, it, it's already happening. And, um, and I just thought that was really, really chilling that, that he, uh, it's like, oh, oh, right, OK, the place where the policies are being made and all, they, they feel like it's out of their hands. They, can, they don't have, I mean, that's, that's the way he yeah. said it to us. Now, obviously, it's not out of their hands. It's very much in their hands. And um, but I know that you guys. Is, are you part of the uh, Nick's tour to the different congressional regions? And um, so I guess this is the No Drones tour. K N O W Drones. Yeah. So like, maybe a lot of people already know about that tour. Yeah. But I just was wondering if you could share just a little bit about it and whether you need support for it and help with it. And then the other question would be. Um, you know, as I was driving up here, I was thinking about all the things that, that I didn't do in terms of organizing for this action, just because of other circumstances. But, but um, and just trying to figure out how to uh, more effectively uh, organize around some of this. Uh, you know, and it's endless, as you probably well know. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up. Nick Modern is in Westchester. And he's built now a dozen, uh, wow. <laughs> one fifth scale Reaper drones, a little bit bigger than this, that go on a, um, a drywall mm -hmm. transporter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very big thing. They go up 12 feet in, in the air, and they're very dramatic. We've had them in Washington and New York. And um, World Can't Wait has its own drone, $350. I always tell people, you're paying for the drones. You may as well have one that'll be <laughs> But what we're using it mainly as an educational device. And it is, as you guys know, it really gets people talking. He's got a couple of them fitted with cameras so that it mimics what a real drone does. There's a, a video camera in the nose. Mm -hmm. And then it's transmitting the images to laptops that are set up next to the drone oh, so wow. you can see cool. yourself <laughs> walking under. 
And he's going all this year to the congressional districts where the Drone Caucus representatives are. And he's not able to come to Chicago. I want to bring the drone to her there for the whole week leading into NATO. And, and why? Because my contention is, and not my contention, what the hell do I know? It's just true that there wouldn't be a NATO without the United States. The United States is the driving and dominant part of NATO. And, you know, Layla mentioned that Turkey, you know, is in a certain relationship. It's now part of NATO. The U.S. has gotten these former Soviet republics and Turkey and brought them into the European colonial domination mode to join with NATO and carry out, you know, the feature of the last 15, 20 years has been these humanitarian interventions in Yugoslavia and Libya, now maybe in Syria, that are, are the exact opposite of humanitarian. Anyway, look, I feel really strongly that people who are against these wars need to be protesting visibly against NATO. Um, World Camp Wave has, as I mentioned, the slogan, humanity and the planet come first, stop the crimes of your government. We've gotten through cloud, our Facebook friends, and some of you who are our Facebook friends know, we've gotten it translated into 22 languages. And we're making very large banners that say, humanity and the planet come first, stop the crimes of your government in the NATO languages, English, French, German, Spanish, Serbian, Turkish. Well, we haven't done Italian yet. If we raise enough money, we will. But also the countries attacked by NATO, Urdu, Dari, Arabic, Farsi. 28 NATO countries now. Yeah, I don't think we'll get that far. But we're going to have at least 10. And part of what we wanted to do in this mass protest was yes, talk about the crimes of NATO. That's very important. But also have people around the rest of the <coughs> world see this message in some of their own languages. Because we know NATO is going to bring the international press. And we really want them to see people in orange jumpsuits protesting torture and drones and the images of victims of the U.S. global war on terror slash NATO and what they've done. We've arranged housing for dozens and dozens of people in Chicago, but unfortunately, not enough people have signed up even um, for a few days of the week leading into the 20th. I think people are coming the 20th, but I came here hoping that uh, you know we could collaborate further on what are the things that we could do that would be really visual and newsworthy in Chicago leading up to that week that would capture people's humanity and, and go for this morality thing? Plenty of other groups are going to be talking about the war is too expensive. Look, people, we've never stopped a war because it was too expensive ever in this country. There's a bottomless pit of money. The only way we've stopped these wars is either by the countries who are targeted successfully stopping them, in the case of Vietnam, or in combination with people here, taking a moral stand against it. And I just don't want to give up on that. Um, you two guys again. Um, you want to go first? No. Oh, I just have one little idea on the 20th. Is there the possibility, Joe, or, or someone else that's on the organizing committee to have a drone contingent in the march? Uh, is, there a is there going to be a drone workshop? Um, probably at the People Summit there will be, but are there some installations you can do during the week leading up to that in different places in Chicago with the help of maybe Occupy Chicago and um, you know, voices, and then have a special contingent, you know, in the March. I, yes, one idea we had, besides doing those installations all week, and getting them fully documented and filmed and on YouTube and internationally seen, 
is that if we can't take the drones in the march because we, you know, who knows what Rahm Emanuel is going to do, we could at least make two-dimensional drones out of foam core and make dozens and dozens of them and march down the street with those kind of drones if we can't take the real thing. <coughs> These models are very effective. I mean, we have, because Nick made one for every single city that's part of the, we ha the first Friday of every month in Binghamton, they have what they call First Friday Night, and you can, you can people walk around from Art Gallery to Art Gallery. And I, on one occasion, I know we set a drone up in front of the federal building where people, pretty, a lot of people walked by and we were able to leaflet under it and it does get a lot of attention. Um, and they are, I mean, standing there with the model and being able to leave it and then engage people in conversation, because it, it drives people to you. Yeah. And Nick a, was, was in Ocean City yesterday in New Jersey, which you know is on the boardwalk. <laughs> It was really interesting because it's a small town, there's a drone congressman there. And the local um, talk radio station came out and the local newspaper. And somebody calls up the congressman's office right from the boardwalk next to the drone. And they're starting to jam them up. Well, what is your position on this? We understand it's killing civilians. And you can't do that without something that really sparks people's imagination. I'm not suggesting this is the only thing to do. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was just the drone idea contingent, yeah. I think, is great. Okay. And although there's been new rules in Chicago about when you have to have permits for demonstrations and on the permit you have to put what every sign is going to be and have to be certain things, because we um, got our permit before those new regulations, which are terrible regulations, were grandfathered in. And so you really can carry anything you want. Um, they could still stop you because they have force. We don't. But uh, I would think having drones there would be great. I would think drones during that whole week and going door to door is a really great idea. Okay. Let me go to the guy in the way back and then to the, to the vet in a second. Okay. Um, I, I, I've just been intrigued by the... Uh, uh, drone con Congress stuff. Yeah. And I mean, as is the case I mean, since the beginning, the economic and industrial side of it, of this whole military complex has been huge. Just curious, who, who, do you know which, which corporation makes the drones? And where does their money go? Is it just that those Congress people or does it, where, where's the trail of that? Is there any work on that? Well, that, actually, that'd be a good thing to raise to Medea tonight. She's got some of that in her new book, which she's bringing. And, you know, I was, when I first heard this, I was thinking, like, what we did to Dow Chemical in 1967. Anyone remembers? There was protest on campuses against Dow Chemical for making napalm. And, but there's... It is, it is so far beyond that. There are drone major programs. Oh, Johns Hopkins, uh, University of Pennsylvania. There are whole graduate programs now in just engineering and piloting drones. And, and you know, I know that there's a lot of corporate money coming into any public campus right now. And that's true with drones. There's so many places that we could start something like that. I wouldn't even know where to begin, but we could figure it out. Well, I know Binghamton University, um, they openly, on, if you go to their web pages <coughs> and you go to their research and development pages, they openly brag about the drone tech um, research they're doing. Yeah. And one professor there, I think his last name is either Hang or Wang, mm -hmm. back in 2003, had applied for a patent on um, the photography technology that he had been done with, the, and it's we've it's really sad because our our society has become so militarized, and there is not enough money for the college campuses that they are making these unholy alliances with these huge corporations and with the government. 
state universities to survive. And um, as this militarization, you know, just takes over everything, it's going to they're going to, you're going to see it in the high school. It's already there because they're talking about being able to operate unmanned aerial vehicles with iPhones and really simplifying the technology so that kids are already trained to do this. Um, you and then, sorry. I would like to get back to the phrase you used that said that every time a military person gets in trouble, uh, with the laws of battle. Uh, the government says it's a cavalry. That only happens once in a while, very rare. But to answer this criticism of the president for the Los Angeles Times, uh, some young, bright, energetic person, uh, it would be very interesting to say, I've listened to the radio for 20 years now, and all of these horrible things that have been happening, like the Blackwater people killing the Iraqis, the soldiers raping the people, feeding on their um, dead bodies, everything, and they're always, the government is investigating it. And the investigation goes on for three or five years, and then you read in a little paragraph that this case was thrown out because uh, it's some legal difficulty. And nobody, uh, you know, goes to jail. Maybe about ten people, a couple from Abu Ghraib, and yeah. uh, that girl soldier or whatever. Yeah. But um, if the if the Los Angeles Times, if you had the connection, they could say stop the crimes of our people and just get the record from all this wonderful internet information when it happened and how long it was investigated and where those soldiers are today. They're not behind the bars. But I mean, it takes a lot of work and effort. I, I can't do that. But I mean, uh, it, the evidence is right there. And, and it would be great for the Los Angeles Times to do that. I, I like that. I've only read it a couple times. But they're the ones that had that wonderful article about those drone pilots that were over there killing those kids that were picking up the wood, wood for yeah. firewood. And, and it takes a lot of courage to be to um, publish something like that in this, uh, what do you call this country now? A security country. Which it, maybe somebody could uh, do it. I feel that exposure is really incredibly important. Part of the problem now is that writing about drones a couple of years ago, hmm. we were really bringing something to people people didn't know. But now, if you read the mainstream news, you're literally barraged every day about the drone war. And look, look, okay. This is why we made this shirt. Crimes are crimes, no. This is the guy that sold it. Bush did not sell the drone war. That was remarkably ineffective. Obama sold the drone war. Obama goes to Northwestern in February and says, look, I talked to a kid, a, a law student that came out of Obama's speech. I was in New York, he was in Evanston, and we were trying to get a report. What did Obama say? He said, well, you know, it was Holder, but it was the Obama policy on extrajudicial assassinations. And of course they said, it's not assassination. It's not. It's extra ju judicial killing. Oh, let's get our terminology <laughs> straight. Right? And essentially what Obama said is, I can kill, as the president, I can kill anybody I want to at any time. Really? What? Yeah. Really? That's what he said. Oh, and it is without apology. And, and I think exposure is really important because he's turned, as Glenn Greenwald says, he's turned the Democrats into a killing machine. The Democrats were no, in my opinion, they were always the war party. I came up during the Vietnam years. The Democrats have been a war party for a long time. But under Bush, the Democrats at least talked a different story. Now they've all signed up with very few exceptions to this whole empire strategy. And I think we have to keep challenging them. 
If you can keep it brief, we're, I just want to I'll keep it a very more. brief. I was a yeah. medic during Vietnam. What I think you need on that T-shirt is the victims of the drones. Now, I went on the internet about a month ago because I went to a conference out in Berkeley about whistleblowers. Well, if we're going to really blow the whistle, we need to show the faces that are blown off, yeah. the blood and the guts that are laying in the street. That's what you need on a t-shirt, or you need it at the bottom of the drone. You know, the drone, that's a nice, uh, and I, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm all for what you're doing. But the other half of that is what's on the ground that's bleeding, screaming, screeching, and uh, you got to get that in there. I would suggest for Chicago, you make a t-shirt that has that on it. The drones at the top and the blood and guts at the bottom, because that's what the bottom line is. Final thing I'll say is that with respect to NATO, I grew up understanding that was to stop the spread of communism and all that stuff. And I studied the Russians when I was in college after that. Anyway, when in 1995 or 7, I actually went to Moscow after I retired from teaching at a high school here 30 years. And though they expanded NATO into Eastern Europe, I thought, what, what is this? You know, the Cold War is over. And uh, so you want to make sure when you talk about NATO, NATO should have been finished in 1991. Correct. Those are my two points. Thank you for listening. I'm going to go home and get some of those pictures. I should have brought them with me because I'll show you what I'm going to do. And I don't give a damn who knows about it either. Oh. Can I just uh, point out that what's going on is this... Uh, this wonderful infatuation with technology that Americans have. So their, their drones feed right into that. You know, your iPhone can run a drone. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's something to... Also, maybe that's we can a bring question. down a drone. Or something. Yeah, maybe we can bring them down with iPhones. Hmm. Uh, Evan, did you, did you have your hand up? No. I'm seeing things. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, no. Yeah. I I didn't have a question, so I have a drone. We have a drone uh, here in the States also, domestically. Do we have it? Yes. Soon. And the, on the border. We're on the border. Some cities have Some, 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 some city police departments have it. Aerial yeah. vehicles from about this big yeah. to full size. And the FAA has been directed to get all the um, licensing and rules in place by 2015 so that they have a lot of access to airspace, which is a, obviously a big concern because drones tend to have a lot of failures and fall out of the air and do things. You know, okay, I'll, I'll tell this one more story. Monday, a, a guy from South Bend called Nick uh, because of the drone tour, which does need help and support. and. He said that his marine son was killed by a drone in Afghanistan in October. Oh, no. And I looked up the news coverage of it. Friendly fire by drone. Mm -hmm. oh, two Marines killed. And he wants a drone for his front yard. And, I'm, and I wow. told him, I said, OK, we'll use the drones in Chicago. You come up and get one, and we'll deliver it to South Bend. But he needs to have a drone in his front yard. He, anybody like that, and he's, you know, at this point not really that much against the war, but he's against the drones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking, I mean, so you said it costs like a few hundred dollars to get one of these, and I, I agree that it's really impactful just to have this like 3D thing. And um, I know there are a lot of people who would like to get the word out and educate people. So maybe there's a way to get some specifications online that would make it easy for people to make sort of like build your own. So, I mean, I don't know whoever makes them. Well, some of you guys learned how to build them last summer, right? There's one who was in the yeah. drone building workshop right here. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, the sister right behind me. All of a sudden, um, I saw Schumer's all for um, increasing our drone power. Is that because he's being bought out or politically being warned that he won't get support? You know? Schumer has never found, seen a repressive law or a murderous scheme that he didn't jump into with both feet. That guy, you know, he's Mr. U.S. Empire. Right. That's why I'm saying about the Democrats. This is the war party. They both are.
I, mean, I, I haven't been involved in this stuff very long. Um, and I think for me, um, you know, knowing the educated Catholic workers and their folks on the drone, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. I don't think the man from South Bend is a perfect example. He he's not really at the point where he's fully against the war or whatnot. But I feel, I mean, it's, it's been 10, 10, 11 years. I mean, it's a long time of the same things in the news over and over again. And if you say, oh, I'm against the war, then you're going to be in one camp, and then there's no conversation. But I think on a specific issue of the drones and flushing that out and seeing the connect, connections and whatnot, it's an interesting opportunity to get at that larger conversation against the imperial war in a very specific, concrete way, rather than just an ideological anti-war stance. I think it's a really interesting opportunity. Right. It really, you know, we just, somehow we have to get conversations going. And that's where people really discover their common humanity and find their outrage. People's outrage has been submerged under all this rhetoric about keeping safe and the war on terror and how dangerous these people are, <coughs> these other nations, these Muslims that we have to set up and jail and, and all the things, that, and we have to surveil them in New York and we have to send the NYPD 3,000 miles across the country to surveil Muslim students. You know, it is insane. And people have adjusted their minds to this, that this is, well, it must be needed because they must know more than we know. We've got to bust this open. We are the ones that have got to bust this open. Can you repeat the phrase about humanity that you're going to put oh, on the banner? Humanity right and the planet come first. Okay. We were trying to figure out how do you bring in sort of a positive morality into a situation where a lot of times we're just like, geez, people being blown to bits and it's just torture and it's too much to deal with. We wanted to bring people back to what their higher aspirations might be. And then it's followed by stop the crimes of your government. Mm -hmm. big, big so, do you think, um, and I'm sorry because I was yeah. I'm trying to do everything at once, but uh, so I, 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 I apologize for bringing up that it's been brought up before, but working towards really inspiring people to nonviolence. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of real activism to do, but then there's a lot of real getting in the elementary schools, talking with people, just really having people, you know, we need to give people a conversion experience to non-violence as a matter of everything. I mean, faith, practice, everything in the, the most <coughs> fundamental and spiritual and pragmatic ways. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, but you know, sometimes, look, what did my generation see? We saw the girl that was napalm. Yeah. running down the road. We saw me lie. Right. We had people coming back right. and saying, right. this was so messed up what we had to do. I hate this country. But, you know, that was my generation, the, the death that left. You know, this, this was our experience of really turning away from what our government was doing. And I have to be honest, I have never turned back to what they're doing. Right. When, and that's why I was, I was just kind of asking asking Layla, when I say we, I always distinguish the people's interests from the government because my whole experience has been with governments who are marauding the whole world and now building it up an empire and I, I, I don't feel an affinity with that and I really feel we have to clearly distinguish that they have their interests, whatever they are. A little hard to fathom sometimes why they're doing what they're doing except it seems to be fostering markets, as Joe was saying. It's right. fostering domination over the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It is not, I will just make the argument that on any measure, it is not possibly making us safer. Right. You know, right. how you're creating enemies mm -hmm. every time you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. People, thought Obama was going to be different around the rest of the world. 
we noticed a big difference in response around the rest of the world, and that's starting to change again. I think this is the woman who gives me the... <laughs> you know, I, I just want to... Yeah, only metaphor. I just want to say that um, uh, I would love to talk to people individually. I brought shirts and buttons and, cool. and videos. I brought the collateral murder DVDs that the brother mm. from the Vietnam veteran was talking about. And um, the outside the line <coughs> video about Guantanamo and things that people can use as resources. And I really want to stay in touch with you and sign people up around housing and being in Chicago. And, you know, we'll, we'll work out the, the logistics and the statistics. Mainly what we need is the passion. And the courage. So, so thank you so much, Deborah. Yeah. Really appreciate it.